tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. A patron today to show your support and get instant access to our extensive archive of downloadable ad-free tales of terror. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Disclaimer. Horror Hill is a horror anthology podcast, bringing you scary stories from all corners of the internet and beyond. As such, certain stories include content that some listeners might find offensive. Listener discretion is advised. Good evening, listeners, and welcome back to Horror Hill. I'm your host, Eric Peabody. And tonight, we'll be featuring a story by J.R. Hamantaschen titled, Bleaker and Bleaker. I'll let you know right now, this is a subtle one, folks, and maybe a bit more ambiguous than some of the other stories we feature on this show. However, I'm sure you'll find yourself thinking about it long after it's finished. Our protagonist is Ken, someone that I think a lot of us can relate to. Ken works a dead-end job in Manhattan. Ken has trouble maintaining a social circle. Ken always feels like he's not saying the right things when he talks to people. In short, Ken needs a friend, and Ken finds one in Kaz, a flamboyantly gay and infectiously buoyant barista at a nearby coffee shop. Ken starts spending more and more time with Kaz, and in doing so, slowly realizes that there's more going on in Kaz's life than meets the eye. You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to help support Horror Hill and also remove these pesky ads, head over to ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. You'll get instant access to hundreds of ad-free stories, and we can scale back some of our uh, less savory means of generating money for the show. By the way, you don't happen to still have all of your organs, do you? And now, from author J.R. Hamantaschen, I give you. Bleaker and Bleaker. So, it's like this, Ken started, breaking through the lull in the conversation that took over at the gathered table. Ken paused to catch himself, noticing his thoughts were getting murky from the alcohol. He hated cliched, rambly, drunk talk, and he wanted to make sure he sounded sharp and put together with this next comment. Actually, I'm Ken, so it's just easier if I tell this first person. So ignore that first part in the third person. I'm Ken, and this story is about me. Sorry for that. I was going to go with an objective literary device, but this is a subjective story, so let's be upfront about that and keep it that way from here on in. So anyway, where was I? 
Right. Sitting around the table, there was me, Tommy, Beth, Ron, Allison, and two or three other people I didn't know. Beth and Allison were identical twins, and Tommy and Ron were each dating a sister. I was friends with Tommy, who was throwing the party at his three-bedroom apartment in Greenpoint, so I guess Aaron, Tommy's roommate, and Aaron's girlfriend were around too. Maybe one of them was also sitting at the table. I'm not sure. Greenpoint is a neighborhood in the northern part of Brooklyn, by the way, that used to be heavily Polish but is now heavily, uh, correction, oppressively, hipster twee. I'm not trying to be pretentious in telling you that part. I understand not everyone knows about New York neighborhoods, so if you already knew that information, I apologize. Just bear with me. So yeah, Tommy, you can do the math. Tommy had a three-bedroom in Greenpoint with only one roommate, so he was doing pretty well. Or his mommy and daddy were doing well and sharing some of the largesse with him, something I had no idea about but suspected. The suspicion was enough for me. <laughs> you got it together there? Ron started with me. Keep it together. Keep it together. You got this. That was him teasing me about slurring my words. i just met Ron that day, but had preemptively judged him as an insufferable douchebag. That decision was final and not appealable. He was someone whose personality seemed derived from the shitty, unfunny movies he'd absorbed throughout his life, and any natural pause in a conversation he used as an opportunity to make himself heard. Even that mantra, the way he repeated it, keep it together, you got this, sounded like some pull quote from some garbage television show or something, and the look he made after, searching for recognition, only lent credence to that conclusion. As additional evidence in support of Ron's douchebaggery, he called Aaron A.A. Ron for reasons that escaped me, but I guess it sounded funny and ironically low class. He'd also committed one of my personal pet peeves. See, I asked him where he was from and he said, Philly. First, he called it Philly, which is obnoxious in and of itself, but naturally I followed up with, Oh, do you mean inside the actual city? Where in Philadelphia? Then he said, Like South Jersey. What town in South Jersey? I continued. Cherry Hill was the answer. So, we go from the mean streets of Philly to the manicured lawns of rich kid USA, Cherry Hill. So I'm sure you too have concluded that Ron is a piece of shit, and are no doubt impressed by my perceptive ability to read people that's good. Keep that in mind for later. What Allison saw in him, who knew? She was too pretty to be with an idiot like Ron, although she was an idiot herself, but a pretty female idiot has higher value on the dating market than a normal bro male idiot, so who knows. Keep in mind, I was pretty drunk at this time too. I pressed on, despite his interruption. What I'm saying is, what has to be interesting about dating twins is, like, the sexual attraction to your partner's sister is just, like, out there. I mean, they look identical. If you think Beth is hot, you have to think Allison is hot. So if Beth is sufficiently attractive for you to sleep with, then Allison must be also. I just think that's interesting. It's like... The quiet things people always think about but don't say. Attraction to your partner's sister. But here it's like, it's so obvious, it's unavoidable. It's like the subtext with other people is like, above the surface here. The or text, is that what that means? Oh boy, someone said. One of the sisters said something like, Exactly, we are exactly the same. 100%. Trying to be sarcastic, but her delivery was shit, so her point was lost. No difference here between the two of us, exactly. The other sister tried to add as a tag to her sister's unacknowledged comment, but she shared her sister's sloppy delivery, ironically undermining their shared point. I thought about pointing that out, but it'd be too mean, and with the cross-talking, my insightful observation would likely be lost. 
I mean, it's interesting, is all I'm saying. I mean, you are identical twins. Identical. It's in the description. If you find one of you attractive, you have to basically find the other one also pretty much in the same... in the same territory, you know? I mean, be honest, Tommy. When you're sleeping with Beth which elicited a bunch of ruckus and laughs, to which I defended my choice of words with, I said sleeping with, I'm being respectful and coy. I didn't say when you're fucking Beth, I'm a gentleman, a gentleman of proper breeding and etiquette. Anyway, as I was saying, when you're fucking with, uh, fucking Beth, are you telling me you don't ever, ever think about Allison? Ever, ever? I mean, just even imagining what it would be like to have, you know, same thing but just slightly different. I'm dating Allison, you moron. You got them reversed. That just proves my point. <laughs> my point is proven. He actually was dating Beth. I was right. He was fucking with me, deflecting the topic. But people laughed at his joke and I let him have his moment in the sun. All I'm saying, it's just, it's interesting. You don't have to answer it. See what he says? You don't have to answer it. You don't have to talk about what you think when being intimate with your girlfriend and your thoughts about her sister. You don't have to answer. <laughs> Thanks, Inspector. See, Tommy was pretty cool. He had a sense of humor about himself. That's what friends are for. See, I like you. We're friends. You don't have to answer. A pause. I don't really like you, though, Ron, so you have to answer the same question. There was laughter at the table and more drinks. I slinked away soon after to smoke a few bowls on the porch with some acquaintances I had from the Tommy circle of friends. Tommy was a good dude. We met because he used to live near the West Village Tech Center where I worked and he'd stop in. We hung out a couple of times and I ingratiated myself into his circle of friends and wound up at cool parties like this. He moved to Brooklyn a couple months ago, to this nice luxury Greenpoint pad where he hung out with his hot girlfriend and her hot twin sister and friends who went to the gym and played shitty EDM music under the name Trash Patch or some dumb thing like that. And I don't know why it was that I liked Tommy but instinctively disliked his other friends and teased him a bit and gave him a bit of a hard time even though he was smarter, better looking, more well adjusted and successful than me. You'll note that I included me saying like a lot in that previous little anecdote. That shows that I'm honest because I easily could have eliminated those likes in the telling of this tale and it certainly would have made me sound smarter and more eloquent if I'd done so but I'm honest. Keep that in mind, too, when it sounds like I'm straining credibility. I guess he didn't like my identical twins' queries, which is too bad, because when we first met, he kind of liked my blunt ways. My blunt ways were partly a pose, an identity I adopted. Like, it came naturally to me, but I amplified it intentionally for comic effect. I guess he didn't like it when it directly involved him, though. Supposedly, both Beth and Allison mentioned to him after the party that they didn't like me and thought I was creepy. I wanted to ask if they both had the exact same opinion on the matter, which would further prove my point about their identicalness. If I remember correctly, I think Tommy told me that Beth had later grilled him about his potential answer to my query and interrogated him as to whether he'd put me up to asking it, maybe to exercise some weird fetish. I guess she didn't believe that a sane person would be so tactless in asking just a naturally interesting question. I mean, identical hot twins. Who wouldn't think about sleeping with the other one? Come on. Come on. The conversation had gotten boring, so I just asked, and people seemed to be laughing and enjoying themselves. Though, again, I was pretty drunk and high, and I don't handle those things particularly well. So, anyway, as you can tell from where this is headed, Tommy and I kind of stopped talking after that. Which is too bad, because if I'm being honest, Tommy was really my only friend in New York at the time. 
At that point, I'd only moved to New York about six months prior, and he was the one person whose apartment was large enough to have people over. So, a lot of weekdays, I'd just go over there and watch movies and drink. And on weekends, we'd go out to brunch with other people and then hang out at his apartment. So, Tommy was basically the axis around which my New York social circle swung. Without Tommy, my New York friend list dropped by a perilous 100%. So, this story isn't going to be about Tommy at all. He's out from here on in. This just sets the stage for where I was at mentally when Kaz came into my life. I didn't mean to bait and switch, but it just sets the sad stage. Me, in New York, essentially friendless, before I met Kaz. And I think the Tommy anecdote is kind of fun. And when I talk about Kaz, I get kind of bummed. Although, it is good to talk about it, I think. So before I move on, let me just set the record straight and state that I was obviously remorseful about upsetting Tommy. I really didn't mean to. I was just fucking around with him. I mean, I don't feel good about it at all. I was resentful toward him with all his friends and success. But you gotta move on, right? I guess I can still reach out to him one of these days. So, anyway, onward and upward. I mentioned before that I worked at Village Tech, which was like an electronics repair store in Greenwich Village on Bleecker Street, the western part of the diagonal, nicer part of the West Village in Manhattan, where none of the streets are straight lines or follow the grid plan that Manhattan's known for. There's the east-west part of Bleecker Street that's like NYU town with the storied past and everything, but is mainly now just cheap trinket stores, bars, and fast food from around the world. Then there's the diagonal part of Bleecker Street that's yuppie tourist town. Boutique cupcake shops, moleskin stores. You know, those $10 artsy notebooks containing 20 pages of paper. Gorin Hat Brothers and, like, Murray's Cheese Shop and Lux Shit all around. Not a practical store in sight. You can get a $30 cheese and a $300 bowler hat, but don't you even think about getting a sandwich under 10 bucks. It's such an odd area because it used to be very popular, but the commercial rents kept going up. So now there's what's called high-end blight. A lot of fancy stores in the area, but also a ton of vacancies because it's harder and harder to find stores willing to put up with such high rents. So anyway, that's where our shop was, for some reason. Even though I'd only been working there in New York for six months, I knew the shop wasn't long for this world. First, I mean, given the location, rent must have been astronomical. Second, these were all tourists in this area. No one flew in from Japan or Argentina to get their computers repaired. Strangely, one of our main sources of income was Brazilian tourists buying electronics to smuggle back into their country to avoid their apparently outrageous import taxes. Strange world, right? Did I tell you how I came to work at Village Tech? It's pretty interesting. You always hear all these negative stories about the American economy, and I'm not saying those aren't true. I guess the story I'm telling ends up being a negative, sad story that takes place in America, after all, but sometimes things do kind of work out for you. At least, temporarily. Before I moved to New York, I was an assistant manager of the electronics section of a Sam's Club in Raymore, Missouri, near where I grew up. They were closing the electronics section down. I guess Raymore, Missouri just didn't have that cultural and retail cash it must have once had. And Sam's Club offered three options to its staff. An employee buyout, an in-house transfer to a different department but with reduced pay, or an out-of-state transfer. I bet they didn't think anyone would take that out-of-state transfer. I wasn't the best employee, but I'd been there a pretty long time, five years, which is a lifetime in retail. I'd always been sufficiently unmotivated in regard to improving my lot in life, and I guess upper management interpreted my life paralysis as company loyalty. So I noticed that one of the transfer opportunities was at a place called Village Tech in New York City. Oh yeah, that's right. People think of Village Tech as this independent institution in the West Village, 
a neighborhood that still coasts off the fumes of supposed independent small business. But in reality, Sam's Club actually bought them out years ago. Anyway, I didn't know that, and I thought, how weird is this? Like, they really needed us hayseeds from Missouri to fill positions in New York City? Was that an oversight on the list? I knew so little about New York City that I didn't realize that it was in Manhattan. I saw the location, Greenwich Village, and thought, a village in New York City? Weird. Like, was it Colonial Williamsburg or something? As a side note, I learned that most New Yorkers would prefer a Colonial Williamsburg to what the neighborhood of Williamsburg, Brooklyn had become, but that's another story. Anyway, so I took the transfer and found myself with a new job, a new city, and no friends, living way out in the ass end of Brooklyn by Coney Island. And outside of the theme park, Coney Island is, mind you, a shithole. Screams of excitable kids during the day, screams of murder victims during the night. Kids passed out from cotton candy sugar high crashes, and adults passed out from heroin crashes. And when it's off-season, forget about it. These are hyperbolic, but you get the point. No one wanted to trek all the way out there, and Tommy had been my only real friend. And now he was out. So I was in a rough space. So, Kaz. He worked right around the corner from me at a coffee shop. That's how we met. Yeah, Kaz. That's what he called himself. I know, right? Hard to tell if that's a man or a woman's name, and I'm sure that was the point. It was his abbreviation of Casimir. I didn't think there were Venezuelans named Casimir. You know, it's not like Castro or Javier or something. When he told me his full name, he had like five additional middle and last names. One was Nacho and one was Pepper. It's not like I checked his ID to verify any of that. I just called him Kaz. So, you know, I looked up the origins of the name Casimir recently, and it's Polish. It's a combination of two words that separately mean to destroy and the world, like Kazidi or something in Polish that means to destroy. Pretty interesting. I'm getting ahead of myself here anyway. Okay, so how's this for a segue? Kaz worked at the gayest coffee shop in the world and he should have been their corporate mascot, and I mean that as a compliment, the highest compliment. He worked at Le Bois, which is French for the wood, and yes, I think the employees made approximately 19 million inappropriate jokes about the name. It's a mid-sized coffee spot that seemed geared more toward a high-volume, in-a-rush crowd. Coffee and grab-and-go bowls of granola, fruit salads, muesli bowls, and all that stuff, you know. I think everyone who worked there was a gay guy or a pretty lady. I don't know why I didn't go there when I first began working at Village Tech, as I do love me some good coffee. Maybe because I liked to play up some folksy Midwestern roots thing, even though that's not who I am at all, and I saw that frou-frou French coffee shop and said fuck it and went to the out-of-the-way Dunkin' Donuts instead. But I found myself in Le Bois one day at an off period, although it was still fairly busy, and one thing I noticed right away is that Kaz had, like, regulars. Like, people would be in line and let others go in front of them so as to time their purchases so that Kaz would ring them up. Kaz was a curious creature. While heavy set, he had graceful, delicate features and was surprisingly agile on his feet. He had wide, pouty, cupid bow lips that should have been featured in the type of high-resolution, black-and-white, erotica-light ads that Chanel, or whoever, used to sell colognes and perfumes. He also had fashy hair and a kind of pompadour swoop. By fashy hair, I mean David Beckham hair, short to the point of shaved on one side, long on the other, clean and tidy with almost a military sheen, although he added that Elvis pomp on top that made me think of frosting on a cupcake. But really, it was his lips that I noticed first. I found it uncomfortable how I was drawn to them. They really were so almost transcendently feminine, 
yet connected to this soft-looking, corpulent male body that always had a slight regnant whiff underneath his cologne of the type of body odor that attached often to sweaty, heavy-set men. If Kaz were straight, he could easily end up as your typical, slightly smelly, lumpen male. But he wasn't. His gayness came, however stereotypically, with the added features of fashion sense, smart cologne, and a kind of in-the-moment vivaciousness that I found clinically curious. Like, how can someone be so happy? He worked what seemed to be a shitty job. A barista, basically. Not even in a tucked-away sacrosanct island of coffee repose where they take faded-over pictures of fluffy cappuccinos embroidered with unicorn designs, but a highly trafficked get-in, get-out type of place. To add to his elan, he was Venezuelan, so he peppered his talk with papis and bits of Spanish phrases whose meaning eluded me but often seemed just right. And if you're thinking I was attracted to him, then you're wrong. But not completely wrong. He was such a strange blend of delicate femininity peppered with a strange, aggressive machismo. It was as if he was somehow striking a blow for all the in-the-closet gay people by being so aggressively sexual at inappropriate times and with inappropriate people, but his latent, tittering femininity balanced that out so people would just find it hilarious instead of off-putting. After we became friends, he'd hug me, or if he liked the colors or design of a shirt I was wearing, he'd just touch the part that he liked, even though he knew it made me a little uncomfortable. Maybe he did it because it made me uncomfortable. I don't know. Anyway, I'm not sure how we became friends, even. I think maybe the first time I was on his line, I said something like, Whoa, you're the popular one here. And he said, Oh, thank you, honey. You're too kind. You're just saying that to cheer me up. And then called to the back room to an unseen co-worker, You hear that? My milkshake's still bringing all the boys to the yard. Such a dated reference, but he completely sold it. If I'm remembering correctly, he was yelling it to that tall Spanish girl I like who works there, and she said something like, Woot woot! And Kaz did this flourishy dance, and she slapped his ass, and he scream laughed in high-pitched surprise, and then wiggled right back at her and said, Don't stop, honey! And it was just kind of amazing to me. I wanted to interview him. It was like... Here was this overweight man who could just as easily be a dumpy wallflower, but through some inherent spark, or maybe studied perseverance, had just become this life of the party. I admired him before I ever got to know him. This one's on the house. Have a great day. See ya, he said, or something like that. So I started going there in the mornings for my coffee, and he recognized me almost immediately. I believe the second time I went in was during a more typical early morning workday rush. There were three people behind the registers, and maybe there were supposed to be three separate lines. At least, that's what the people I assumed were managers would often say. Something like, three separate lines, people. The whole line thing was amorphous. You know the drill. People standing ambiguously in multiple lines and then opportunistically darting to the closest available cashier. All except the Kaz lines. Those people were rigid about line order. Those people waited for their man. And on that second time I visited, he said, I know you, so what's your name? That will make this a whole lot easier going forward. I told him, he told me his, and added, I know, the world's only lonely gay Venezuelan named Casimir. It's a cool name. Why, thank you, you're sweet. And I got my order that day, a grab-and-go little plastic pot of muesli with nuts and Greek yogurt, a large iced coffee, and a cup of water, on the house. I soon became what was known at the store as a customer. I basically got the same thing every time. I'd say about half the time I paid for it. Other times, Kaz would give it to me for free. He said at some point on the sly that to reward loyal customers, the store had an unofficial policy of giving stuff away for free, part of their attempt to create a festive atmosphere. 
but I never caught any other employee doing it, and I'm sure the policy wasn't meant to be exploited so excessively. But who was I to complain? I told him a couple of times that he didn't need to give me the stuff for free, and I always had a credit card out in case I had to pay, although that was just for optics. Truth was, when he made me pay, I'd think, damn it. You know, like every little bit helps. He learned that I put just a splash of cream in my coffee, so he'd always give me just enough room. Even though the other employees were usually present and must have heard my orders, they never seemed to remember who I was, so whenever someone other than Kaz took my order, I'd always have to restate it. Half the time, I'd get a cup of ice instead of a cup of ice water, or they'd neglect to give me room for cream, and I'd never get it all for free, although that last bit couldn't really be expected. But really, who would order a cup of ice? And when Kaz wasn't in, I swear the efficiency at that place dropped by at least 50%. They had this stupid general policy of having people order and pay at the register, then another barista behind the counter would make the drink while you waited on the side counter. This always resulted in bunching at the side of the counter and people impatiently waiting in a too tight corner of the shop. Kaz had none of that shit and took the order and made the drinks himself and handed them to you without relegating you to the side corner ghetto. That's what he said. No corner ghetto for my folks. He was the soul of that place. I remember there was some Star Wars related thing. Actually, I think it was May 4. You know, May the 4th be with you. And he came dressed up as a still fashionable Ewok. None of the other employees went that far. Most times it would be too busy for any real conversation, but I'd come at off-peak hours to speak to him. At first, I felt it was partially out of obligation. I mean, this guy's giving me, what, probably like 50 bucks worth of free food and drinks a week? I could at least learn about him. Also, again, I was curious and he made me feel good. He had a real zest for life, and somehow he inexplicably saw those same qualities in me. Nuts, I know, right? From the very beginning, he often said how nice I was and that I was always friendly and seemed chill. And the cynical side of me thought, yeah, I seem chill because that's getting me free food. But that wasn't really true, if I'm being honest. It's like a city full of people who, at best, brush past you without giving you a second glance and, at worst, actively trample over you. And here was this guy, always with a smile, who took pride in his appearance and presentation. So anyway, on those slower times, I told him a bit about myself, and I learned a bit about him. He was, as mentioned, from Venezuela, but was white as snow, because his ancestors had all emigrated from Europe. I think Portugal, he said, or maybe Italy? Not Spain, because that'd be too easy for people moving to a Spanish-speaking country. He was a struggling actor and lived in East Harlem, and he made some offhand references to dates he was going on. He went on so many dates that I half-wished I was gay. You know what I'm talking about. The way Kaz described it, any gay man could step out of his apartment and fuck or get fucked at will, basically. And God bless them for that. I made references to being heterosexual. I don't remember what exactly. Don't worry, nothing as obvious as blurting out a sexualized comment about any of his pretty co-workers or saying, Me like titties, or anything. I don't know what it was. I think I mentioned a girl by name I hooked up with like four months ago. I know, such a master dropper of cues I am, displaying those heterosexual credentials, but I just didn't want him to think I was interested in him sexually. Honey, I knew you were straight from the moment you walked in there with your little off-the-rack Levi's and Mr. Man button-ups, he'd said, or something like that, although I guess it had to be that, because where else would I get Mr. Man from? I don't even know what that meant. I tried to give him a tip one time, although they don't have tip cups, oddly enough. I know, it seems like every barista has a tip cup these days, like, god damn, now we're supposed to tip them too? But him, I wanted to tip. 
He said I was sweet in his cazzy way, but deflected for a while with an aggressive smack of my wrist. But I insisted, and he eventually accepted some tips. Some of those tips I left were quite generous, I might add, like 20 bucks. But the tips were just here and there. I was still getting way more value from a purely transactional standpoint. So, maybe two months into our little relationship of sorts, I told him I wanted to take him out for lunch. I took him out to a dosa place nearby on Bleecker. Nothing fancy, but not cheap either. I think on Yelp it was a $2 signer, which means average price. You know, to pay him back for all the free coffee and muesli. It was pretty funny. That first time I picked him up outside of the shop, he gave me a big Kaz hug, which would become a Kaz tradition. I always hugged him back weekly, just because it's, of course, strange to hug a male friend, especially one as strangely soft as Kaz. I only did that because I knew it'd make you uncomfortable, he said, in that way he has of making everything charming and frivolous. What would a Kaz, unrestrained by workplace etiquette, be like? Our lunch date made me envious of his life. Over doses and with a steady backbeat of classic hip-hop, which is the musical selection at every minimally or aspiringly hip New York eatery, he casually mentioned that his father was apparently an extremely wealthy business owner back in Caracas and owned factories that produced, like, aluminum products or something. It's weird. With a certain type of person, I loved being a bit of a dickish edgelord troll. It's my version of afflicting the comfortable and comforting the afflicted. On the one hand, I love getting a reaction out of people. On the other, I always want people to like me. What a dilemma. Anyway, with Kaz, I thought to myself for a second about the impropriety of asking a question based on my natural reaction, which was something like, I didn't know there were rich people left in Venezuela. But then I said it anyway. He laughed and said Venezuela's horrible. He had no idea how long his dad could last, but his dad was connected to the powers that be down there. Kaz was sent to New York for the unstated but acknowledged reason that his family didn't approve of his homosexuality. Not like Islamic throw-you-off-a-building disapproval, he explained. More like in-denial South American machismo disapproval. Like where Kaz's brothers played with toy cars and water guns when they were little, he was adding stylish flair to the toy cars, putting flowers in the water pistols, and playing dress-up with his sister's Barbies. His family didn't know what to do with him once he got older and his homosexuality became obvious to anyone with eyes. So, with the pretext of keeping him safe from the phantom, even more homophobic other Venezuelans, his father had him educated abroad in America set him up with a nice one-bedroom apartment, and paid him a monthly stipend. So much for the struggling actor. Shit, sounds like a good deal to me. You don't hear it spoken too much, but I'm working on making gay privilege a thing. I revealed a little bit of myself to him, about my insecurities, I suppose, although those are the same insecurities I express to anyone after I've known them for, like, more than a few seconds. You know, living in poverty, being a rudderless failure slash loser. I broke out my old chestnut, how I'm glad I'm at least currently employed and housed instead of hanging outside of Home Depots giving hand jobs to Mexican day laborers for wooden nickels. He laughed and smiled energetically, saying something like, Well, it's always good to have a plan B. Shit, doing it for wooden nickels would be an improvement. I've been doing it for so long without getting paid, I think I'm good enough to get a few shekels thrown my way. The Wooden Nichols Mexican Day Laborers line is one I've used before, and it often serves as a kind of coolness litmus test. If the other party laughs, or even better, plays along, then they're cool. If they look uncomfortable or swiftly change the subject, then they suck. And trust me, I've had plenty of those latter reactions which I sort of find exhilaratingly hilarious. But Kaz was cool. His homosexuality gave the talk of handjobs a kind of teetering, on-the-edge thrill. 
It was fun to tease, hop over the line of propriety, and run back and yell, Just kidding! Safe! No backsies! So, I'd say from then on we got lunch about every other week. Always me paying, although he'd offer, but I'd insist, you know, based on all the free food. I'd see some of the other regular customers and wonder if he went out to lunch with any of them, too, although he mentioned at some point that he didn't. I believed him. He indulged me even more than his other customers, but I'd call him a liar and a food whore. He'd say, Look who's talking. At least I'm gay for real. You're just gay for muesli. I was also still forcing tips on him. Not much, like $10 in the weeks we didn't get lunch or something. It occurred to me that what had basically been a kind of gratuity on his end had basically devolved into bribery. I was paying him and treating him to meals in return for free breakfast and coffee. I told him he didn't need to keep spoiling me with the coffees and stuff, which only made him seem to delight in really hamming it up. Like, one time I came in and he walked up to me in the line, took the muesli, went behind the counter and made the iced coffee and ice water, put the muesli in a bag for me, put it to the side, and announced, I know honey needs his muesli. To which I'm sure I rolled my eyes and said, Come on, Kaz, even for you that's too much. But he loved every fucking second of it. And it should have felt embarrassing, but it didn't. And I didn't mind the way the attractive female staff looked at me. Women loved Kaz. I'm gonna get you laid one day, he promised me. So, anyway, I'm losing the thrust of all this. I just... I miss those days, strangely. And I guess I'm trying to paint a scene. Because it really was too much. I mean, just for his own job, you know. Like, as much as everyone loved Kaz, there's no way on earth the management wasn't probably doing some mental math about all the money they were losing on his giveaways. It was maybe a few months into our friendship when I first visited his apartment. I mentioned it was in East Harlem, somewhere in the 110s between 3rd and 2nd, which is not a gentrified neighborhood by any stretch, despite what the realtors might tell you. But the apartment itself was huge and just as fabulously decorated as you might imagine. Kaz was a bit of a cinephile, which makes sense since he was an aspiring actor, and we blazed and watched, I'm not sure what, I think five easy pieces? Good movie. He blazed all the time, actually. I didn't mention that, but he did. I don't remember him saying anything around that time about things at work other than that, despite his unbelievably sunny disposition, he didn't like the barista gig because A. Retail sucks, and B. He's an actor, after all. Acting was his passion. He said he was immersed in a two-year method acting residency as a chronically blazed, depressed homo sprite barista. I think at this time maybe he had the green dye in his hair. I told him he deserved to win an Oscar. I'd never believe he had even the slightest inkling of depression. I remember he got a loud knock on his door while we were watching the movie. Maybe he'd also been getting a lot of text messages and not responding to them. I don't know. Maybe I'm just imagining that now, but I definitely remember the knock on the door. It was more like a solid pounding, and remember, this is East Harlem. You don't just open the door when someone bangs on it. Shit, even I was nervous. But he just paused the movie and got up, and I think I said, do you know who that is? And he opened the door slightly and said something in hushed but sharp tones in Spanish. Another note about myself. Missouri actually has far fewer Latinos than the rest of the country. You wouldn't necessarily guess that with St. Louis and Kansas City being large cities and all, but that's the defense I'm sticking to as to why my Spanish is so bad. Also, I suck ass at languages and retained nothing from my three or so years of high school Spanish other than Donde esta baño and Me llamo Kenny the diminutive version sounding more appropriate in Spanish with all the vowel-ending sounds. So, I had no idea what he was saying, basically. 
but the conversation was brief and short, and I never heard what the other person was saying, and he or she never came in. Everything all right? The usual open book Kaz didn't exactly blow me off, but he said it was nothing and used some Spanish expression that I gathered meant nosy neighbor. I tried to inquire a bit more, you know, I'm pushy myself, but he deflected more, as if the subject was intensely boring and just encouraged more blazing. I didn't object. We used the pause of the movie to smoke more, and then finished the film. Around this time period, I think I asked Kaz about some of his acting gigs and everything, and watched a demo reel taken from some off-off Broadway shows he'd done. I remember there was some web series he was auditioning for that would film in Toronto. I also remember him talking about putting together a one-man show, although he was hesitant to tell me what it would be about. He finally told me, The Immigrant Experience, which made me mentally roll my eyes since he was an exceedingly wealthy white guy. I don't think he was really the archetypical immigrant, but whatever. He mentioned around this time he really needed to get out of New York, and maybe it was about this time that I pieced together his excessive marijuana use, his comments about his job and his family, and deduced, using that big brain of mine, that maybe he was seriously depressed, and maybe things weren't alright in Casimir land. I also have the tendency to pathologize other people in the same way I assume people pathologize me. I'm always diagnosing people as having the same problems as me. We did talk about his depression, here and there. He mentioned that maybe his father's feelings towards him leaned more toward antipathy than he first let on. That was the word he used, antipathy. I asked him how his father would feel if he became a famous, well-respected actor, in a way that suggested he was talented and it was only a matter of time before he got his big break. He said something like his father would hate that, because if he got famous, people would know he was his father's son and his father couldn't then disavow him. I asked if his father knew he was an aspiring actor, and he said he did, but I wasn't convinced entirely. It seemed more like Kaz told his father in a way that maybe ensured his father didn't understand, like there'd been a miscommunication between him and his father and Kaz did nothing to correct the misperception. I could picture Kaz taking advantage of some technicality like that, not telling his dad exactly what he was up to to ensure those stipends kept coming in. So, I know this doesn't sound like much, and there isn't going to be much, really. It's just little things I'm trying to connect, you know? Like, you don't see big moments while they're happening. That's not the way things work in the real world. You can drive yourself crazy by obsessing over these things. I did notice that he was working less shifts. When I first started hanging out at the coffee shop, he worked every weekday, but then it'd be three days a week, and then down to just two. I remember it was down to two before he got the axe, and maybe it was partly my fault he got the axe, because when he was down to two... I'd feel especially inclined to take him out to lunch or tip him because I felt bad about his increasingly worse work circumstances. Actually, now that I think about it, I asked him about his reduced work schedule around that time and he said he was missing work for some auditions and that seemed perfectly plausible. A guy like Kaz wasn't going to be a barista forever. I half didn't want him to get the web series in Canada because he was the only person I hung out with, really. I remember I hadn't seen him for a week or so when, oh, I should add, Kaz could be pretty terrible at responding to Facebook or texts at times, which is just something you had to get used to with him. I mean, something a normal person would have to get used to. I never did. I found it infuriating especially when a diva like Kaz could post 10 different changing hairstyle pictures in an hour and neglect to respond to a message. Fucking infuriating. But again, you just couldn't really get mad at the guy. The second he responded, those bad tidings would all just melt away. But I'd noticed he wasn't working and he hadn't responded to the texts I'd sent. 
I asked that fine Latina co-worker who said, with obvious pain, that Kaz wasn't working there anymore. I was shocked. Apparently, behind the scenes, it wasn't as big a surprise, although all the rank-and-file co-workers loved him. Management, suffice to say, not as big a fan. I feared that it had partially been my fault. I'd seen some of the disapproving stares from employees that looked a bit more like authority figures than the average sunny barista. Really, any employee who wasn't farting rainbows and doing handstands was probably management. I called him soon after, which I'd rarely done before. We both hated phone calls as a matter of principle, but I was genuinely concerned for him. Sure, he didn't need the money and he said how much he hated the job, but I thought he was just saying that. He loved that place, and that place loved him. It's bullshit, man, I told him when I finally got in touch with him and we met up at a cafe in Harlem, and of course he agreed, but nonchalantly. Like, I was madder about it than he was. Poppy, be serious. You're just mad now that you're going to have to pay for all that muesli. No, fuck them, I resolved. I was not going back to that place anymore. Kaz was that place. He tried to pass it off as no big deal and said he wished them nothing but the best and he wasn't sullen or anything. That just wasn't in his DNA. He'd said other people were getting laid off and he'd had a bad attitude behind the scenes, which I didn't believe for a second. It was just a stupid coffee spot, nothing to get too worked up over. I didn't ask him if he got fired for giving away too many products, which is what I suspected. I told him I was sorry that I wouldn't see him every day, but that I'd still be around for whenever. Would I even willingly come up to East Harlem, he asked knowing that I always preferred to hang out in what we might call safer neighborhoods. Yeah, Kaz, even East Harlem. And will I get a departing hug this time without your squirming to get away? Kaz, like I even have the ability to squirm with how tight you squeeze me. That's what I like to hear. See, I can be a good guy, when push comes to shove. Despite all the promises, I just didn't see Kaz much in the following weeks. I was applying for other jobs myself, and also around that time I think I was going on a couple of meetups, maybe because I wanted to avoid a situation where I depended too much on just one friend. That's a situation I've found myself in several times over the years, and my time in New York had been no different. I remember I got a Facebook message from him. Let me see. I can read it right now. It said, Hey, Poppy, can I crash at your place if need be? It doesn't look like I responded on Facebook. I guess I responded by text, but I don't have that phone anymore. It's sometimes hard to read Kaz, as I mentioned. He liked being up front and making things a bit uncomfortable, and I'm sure I brushed that off as Kaz being too forward. You know... The hugs, the making things uncomfortable when it was good for a laugh. I mean, I wouldn't want him to crash with me, and also, of course, it wasn't my place to do so. I had roommates, and he'd never met any one of them. I'm sure I said something like, sure, if necessary, or sure, but the second you blast Scissor Sisters after midnight, you're getting the boot. I met him some time after that. I believe it was around June or July... Maybe about three or four months since we started hanging out. I remember he wanted to meet up at his apartment, but I demurred. That's such a trek for me. So we met downtown at a place called Cones on Bleecker Street. By the way, Kaz hated the big gay ice cream truck mini empire that was popular in New York at the time. He claimed they stole his pizzazz. So, we're getting gelato, and I remember I get a large, which is three scoops, and he gets a small, which is one. I don't know why I remember that. I figured he was on a diet. He looked good. He'd obviously lost a ton of weight since I first met him, and lost weight since the last time I'd seen him, just a couple of weeks ago. But like I mentioned, he was... Zoftig. That's a great word, and the word that I feel best conjures him up. Like pleasantly plumb. 
Like, if a fat person loses a ton of weight, they aren't skinny yet, you know? And because he didn't look skinny skinny or sickly skinny, it was hard for me to really tell if something was wrong, but he was definitely losing weight. And Kaz, he must have been a good actor. When I had first told him he had a big break just around the corner, I was just saying that to be polite. I mean, it's hard to tell when someone in a terrible off-off Broadway play is talented, you know? And when I'm talking off-off Broadway, I'm talking like... Kaz's plays were the Staten Island equivalent of off-off Broadway. But either I'm daft or he's a convincing actor, because as we ate our gelato, I had no idea anything was seriously wrong. So we ate our gelato outside on the little benches, looking at all the passers-by, enjoying the fine summery weather. I remember two European-looking blondes passed by, and Kaz waved at them to get their attention and complimented the color of their dresses, and they smiled at him, and, by extension, at me. Who could pull stuff like that off except Kaz? Pretty ladies like them would naturally be standoffish from any unsolicited street-level compliment, but a big, gay, fun dandy like Kaz posed no threat. He just radiated love. I remember that, and I remember after we'd finished up our gelatos, he asked me, Do you ever just want to get away? It's something I figured might be coming. Maybe acting wasn't working out. He was still unemployed, but he had money. Why not go and try something new somewhere else? Hell, I would. I'm sure I agreed. I can just disappear if I want to, I remember him saying. At this point, I'm sure I was just nodding along. But I don't want to. I like being me. I like you being you too. I remember saying that because it's so dumb. I don't think I'm going to be around much longer. I guess I wasn't done with my gelato around that time because I remember having a spoonful in my mouth when he said that. I have a weird habit of chewing on things. I remember chewing on the plastic spoon and taking it out of my mouth to respond. Don't say that, man. We'll be around as long as you want to be. Not if my dad can help it. And he can. Back into the tank with me. I don't remember what I started saying at that point, because then he just started speaking. There's really something to it. Just merging. Just imagine merging into another person. Just disappearing. All your troubles just disappearing, knowing that you aren't alone anymore. And I remember his eyes were closed as he spoke. And at the time, I thought it was nice. We were really connecting. And it is nice. Trust me. It's nice. It's like being in a warm bath. I'm sure I said, hmm, or something at that point. I don't remember Kaz not seeming lucid or seeming particularly stoned. Plus, from my experience, he could always handle his high. I frankly, of course, didn't know what the fuck he was talking about. The thing is, though, talk about warm baths, it sounds nice, doesn't it? But who wants to take baths? You grow out of that. And here was my contribution. Yeah, plus your tub gets all dirty, and you're sitting in your own filth, too, if you think about it. I remember taking a bath when I was young and seeing, like, the dirt floating around in the water and thinking, man, that's going to go right back on me. I remember dispensing that pearl of wisdom. Don't ever change, Ken. Don't plan to. It's just, my father is going to make me get back into the bath, so to speak. I fucked up now, and there's nothing I can do about it. You're an adult now, though. You can do what you want. I mean, no offense, but New York definitely beats Venezuela. This is your home now. I had just assumed maybe his dad was threatening to stop paying his rent or something. It's the worst of both worlds. I don't want to get back into the tub, so he's going to drown me in it, so to speak. At this point, I had no idea what he was talking about or how to respond. I think I gingerly tried to broach the subject, 
Like, what did he mean? What could his father really do to him? I remember he said other things about this melding, and there was some crosstalk where I was just trying to figure out what the hell he was talking about, and I missed a bit of what he was saying. When I think about it now, I can hear him saying, chul, like ritual, which might be just my imagination. But I do remember he said, in a real quiet, sad way, and with finality, he can make it happen, and there's nothing I can do about it. I'd never seen Kaz so undeniably low before. Like, it just did not compute. This gaudy firecracker of a man looking down at the ground like that, like on the verge of tears. Not literally. I don't remember seeing him about to cry, or I don't think I remember seeing him about to burst into waterworks, but just the way he looked, so downcast. It was like seeing a puppy with a set of crutches or a rubber ducky with an eye patch shaking a paper cup, begging for change on the street. It just... it was wrong. I think I asked if he wanted to go to a bar and talk about it. You know, a bar is a more appropriate venue for these talks than a curbside bench. I think he said sure, but without looking at me. He didn't move to get up, and maybe I was waiting for him. Neither of us got up. So, I just started nervously talking. Maybe I'll get a shandy at the bar. No one likes shandies, but it feels like shandy weather, you know? Everyone hates on shandies. I wonder if there's, like, a type of shandy that the shandy connoisseurs use to get people into liking shandies. You know, like, try this. You think you know shandies? Well, try this. This will blow your fucking mind. Although, I guess that's tough, because a shandy can be made with any soft drink, technically, right? What do you think, Kaz? Think there are special shandies like that? I remember he looked up at me, and it was heartbreaking. He looked at me, then away, wiping away at his face or something, like debating with himself whether he wanted to say it. It all started when I lost that job. I fucked up, real bad. My father didn't like that. Even though the money was nothing, he didn't like that. He thinks it shows that I'm not, like, fit to exist. On my own, I mean. It was a mistake, and now he really thinks I'm a mistake. I mean, he's always thought that, but losing that job cemented that idea in his mind. I didn't even tell him. He just knew. So, I'm a dead man, really. I'm dead. I'm a dead Kaz walking. And before I could offer any placating words, he said something that drove a dagger through my heart. It was those giveaways, Ken. It was those giveaways and you tipping me for them and treating me to lunch for them. They saw it as bribes. They did, they did. I shouldn't have given away all that stuff. I've always wanted people to like me, you know. It was those giveaways. I shouldn't have done it. Kaz, I'm so sorry. I, I said a million times you didn't have to give me that stuff. You know, I can pay for my own coffee, you know. I know, Kenny. It wasn't your fault. I forced you. You know how I can be. And I'll never forget the look he made after that. It was so fleeting, and it's so easy to read things that weren't there, but he refused to make eye contact, like he was going back and forth in his mind about what to say. Then he said, There's a way you can pay me back. I don't know how my face looked when I heard that. It might have been a look of shameful indignation. I'm a defensive person. I don't take being attacked very well or made to feel bad or responsible for something, even if it is my fault. But here, was it my fault? He just said himself it wasn't. True, I accepted his free food, but I'd told him he didn't need to. And now it's my fault he lost his job? Sure, I said, but rather than really focusing, I was sorting through my own hurt and bruised ego. 
I'm sure my throat felt sour, my head was swimming, and there were evil little butterflies taking flight in my stomach. That's the way I feel when I'm, quote, under attack. I need you to shave off all your hair and give it to me. I think I laughed. He was just fucking with me, I figured. Well played. His jokes were usually quick one-liners or something. He'd never wound me up like that only to deflate the tension. But he wasn't laughing. In fact, he looked despondent, the worst I ever saw him. Maybe he saw then that his back was really against the wall. Seriously? He put his face in his hands and said something like, Forget it. But I didn't entirely hear him. Seriously? What would you do? Wear my hair as a makeshift beard or something? Or you want me to like, what, embarrass myself in solidarity with you? I was halfway between being offended but still suspecting he was just fucking with me. Fucking with me in an unusually cruel, elaborate, un like way, but fucking with me nonetheless. It's not that. It's not that. I, I need help. It's the only thing, he said. But at this point his attitude changed because maybe he embraced the failure? Kind of like you're backed up against the cliff and you're out of bullets and you see the bull is still charging. Like, what are you going to do except light the cigarette and jump off? If you're not going to give me your hair, then you definitely won't give me your blood or a tooth. Hair was just the baby step. I can't blame you. I don't remember how I responded to that. I don't think I did, at least not directly. Maybe I joked, saying there had to be other ways to humiliate me to make him feel better. Maybe I offered him my shaved pubes as a penance. Maybe I said blood and hair sacrifices were the first time I saw him really get in touch with his South American roots. I don't know what I said, or if I really said anything. I think I actually just stayed relatively quiet, mumbled half-apologies in confusion. If I recall, I think I did. Yeah, that's right. I did say I'd shave my hair for him if he really wanted. Of course, I didn't expect him to follow through with that. Like, I expected him to just say, Of course you don't need to do that. I don't think he responded. We never got that beer. I think he apologized for himself, said he was just acting crazy and under a lot of stress with his father and had dropped acid recently and was still on a residual bad trip, which isn't how I think acid actually works, but who am I to say? I reached out to him the next day. I think I called him after work and left a voicemail. Didn't hear back. Texted him a couple more times that week, then maybe messaged him on Facebook. No answer. Then, maybe a week after that phone call, I got a Facebook message from him. Here, give me a second and I can look it up. I have it in my inbox. To my favorite customer, Kenneth. Or, because it's my last message, Kenny Ken Kennedy. I appreciate your friendship. I'll tell the girls of Le Bois to have a giant orgy with you, but I don't know what sway I have there anymore. And don't worry about not letting me crash with you out there in Coney Island. While I do love the Mermaid Parade, that's only once a year, and I don't think Coney Island would have been able to contain all of the Fantasia that is Casimir. I won't lie, Ken. I'm scared. I shouldn't write that in this message since there's nothing we can do about it but I feel the urge to be honest about it. There's a fabulousness to this world. I would recommend doing mushrooms sometimes. While I know they scare you, they are a relatively safe way to expand your mental horizons to come to grips, even if just a little bit, to the possibility of wider realities. That sounds like such pretentious nonsense, I know. Such pretentious caterwauling. Just know that there is such a thing as true transcendent connectivity. It can be used for good or ill. When it's good, it's a feeling of such bliss, 
to feel all your problems slip away. Wouldn't it be nice for all your fears, your failures, your self-hatred and loathing, everything you think is wrong about yourself, to just disappear? I know you feel listless and bored and cranky. I know what that feeling is like. I know you feel like life is essentially meaningless and boring and disappointing. And in a sense, it is, at least in the way life is currently lived. But there are other ways. There's a way to get there, too. It's a true connectivity with the universe. Maybe it's the way we are before we're born. My father is going to force me back into some kind of inferior version of all that. I'm too much of an original for him, smiley face. It's a strange thing, because as good as that all sounds, I don't want to go back to it. But I don't have a choice in this matter. But I don't want to scare you or let you down. I don't want you to worry about me. I shouldn't have said as much as I did because I don't want any trouble to find you. Just think of me back in Venezuela, but in a happy Venezuela. Just picture people drinking cocktails out of pineapples or melons. It's a bullshit image, but then again, what isn't? What a downer to end on. But you're a downer of a guy, aren't you? Just know that I mean that in the best way possible. Don't ever change unless it's to become happy. Of course, I called and texted and messaged him. I never got an email address from him. Days passed and I didn't hear from him. Then his phone disconnected. Then I stopped by the coffee shop and no one had seen him. I remember calling his number again around that time and someone else answered, like the number had been purchased by someone else who didn't speak any English. I didn't know what language these people were speaking, so that was an obvious dead end. I went up to his apartment in East Harlem. It wasn't hard to follow someone into the building. The first night I went, no one answered. The following night, I went and a shy, hesitant, but ultimately friendly woman answered. It seemed the apartment was now occupied by what I'm guessing was a Dominican family of five, all in Kaz's large one-bedroom. I did my best with my elementary Spanish to ask the woman and her husband about Casimir, but they'd never met him. Their oldest son, who seemed to be in his early teens, spoke English and told me they'd never met the previous occupant, and I agreed that if they had met Casimir, they'd remember him. They gave me the live-in super's number, and his English wasn't too good either, but he definitely knew Casimir and said he moved out a few weeks ago. I asked him how he learned Casimir intended to move out. Like, did Kaz come into his office one day and pay the last month's rent or something and announce he was moving out? Or did he just bail? The super understandably wanted to know why I cared, and I told him I just wanted to make sure my friend was alright. He'd been acting weird recently. The super said things like, You'll know how things are in buildings like these. And other things which given the circumstances, left me with a vaguely sinister impression. But I don't think that's how he meant it. I think he meant it more like Casimir didn't have an official lease and was probably paying straight cash on a month-to-month -month basis. I asked him how Casimir moved out, and he said that he hadn't actually seen Casimir himself in quite a while. But he remembers that several weeks ago, several men came in and cleared out all of Casimir's stuff. They didn't seem like they were from a typical moving company, you know. He didn't remember any uniform or logos or anything that suggested they were a moving company, but he wasn't really paying attention. He just prepared the service elevator for him, you know. I'd resolved to reach out to some of his other Facebook friends to find out how he was doing. I remember debating about who to reach out to and was surprised that he had so few Facebook friends for such an outgoing guy. I looked for people who shared any of his last names in his friends list, but didn't find any. And then, I noticed the change to the top of his Facebook page. Remembering Casimir. I was stunned and horrified, of course. I think that was a Facebook thing. 
When they learn of someone's death, they automatically convert the page into an in-memoriam dedication. I couldn't deal with it. I was heartbroken. The following day, there was a picture uploaded to his profile. It was adorned with a sentence or two of Spanish that I wish I'd saved. I don't know who uploaded it. You know those weird photographs you see at the bottom of websites or in pop-up ad things? Those ads that show, like, impossible pictures that you know are photoshopped or something to get you to click? Like those, You won't believe they took this photograph! Or, Look what they just found at the bottom of this lake! I thought it had to be one of those for a second, but there it was on his Facebook page. It was like a bloated, balded, waxen-looking round face. The vantage point was like you were standing by the body's midsection and looking straight at the face. The skin had the complexion and rubbery texture of a hard-boiled egg. You know, what is it? Roe? Those pink fish eggs? There was, like, yellow roe-looking things, but maybe bigger than roe eggs, maybe twice the size. They looked like little sacks. And those sacks were spilling out of his empty eye sockets. And it was Casimir. I knew it. I could tell in the face, in the nose. It was him. And the next day, it was gone. The whole In Memoriam page. It made me think the In Memoriam was put up automatically when some tidbit of information about Casimir's death floated onto the internet. Maybe some online web crawler picked up a death certificate or something and cross-referenced it to a Facebook page, and the changes were made instantaneously. One of those things that even the most airtight operation can't control with the way technology works these days. But then, someone caught wind and pulled the Facebook page offline. So, if it's some kind of conspiracy, they're good, but not infallible. I searched online for Casimir with all his surnames and put in searches for New York or Caracas or Venezuela, but I never found anything. I looked up the largest aluminum manufacturers in Venezuela, but what am I going to do with that? So, that's it, really. See, I told you that you might be disappointed. I am, I suppose. But that's the way things are in the real world. And this is nothing if not the real world. I'm proud to say I've been living in the real world my whole life. I've moved back to Missouri. Kaz's situation didn't cause my departure, but it did hasten it. I'd had my big city fun, and it wasn't for me, I tell myself. I tell myself to do something. It's only been a couple of months since Kaz's death has been confirmed, and I consider that Facebook mishap a confirmation, albeit a removed confirmation. I still feel indignant about what happened, and the wound is still raw, and the memory still fresh. The ardor is still there not yet dulled by job searches and the churn and burn of my Missouri transition and the natural eroding process of time. But how long is it going to last? And how will it survive the pressures and distractions of daily living? I don't know. But if I'm honest, I'm not hopeful. Because it's a big, wide, scary world out there. And while Kaz spoke about this blissful connectivity... I don't know anything about that. I hope he was telling the truth, or speaking from some kind of experience, but that picture I saw certainly didn't look blissful. It looked terrible. It's the worst thing I've ever seen in my entire life. Kaz spoke about some altered, blissful state but that's not a state I know anything about. I only know about the real world, where the best you can hope for is to just manage and maintain.
You've been listening to Bleaker and Bleaker by J.R. Hamantaschen. J.R. Hamantaschen is a writer of short stories, having released several collections, including A Deep Horror That Was Very Nearly Awe, with a voice that is often still confused but is becoming ever louder and clearer, and You Shall Never Know Security. JR also co-hosts a horror podcast called The Horror of Nachos and Hamantaschen. You can find collections of his work at Velux Books, www.veloxbooks.com. The human experience is truly an interesting one, isn't it, folks? We're all just going about our lives, surrounded by people, and yet still so alone on the inside. Are we acting normal? Do others actually like us or just tolerate us? How can we properly express our inner feelings when we're unaware of the potential nightmares that others are struggling through? Isn't that last point a paradox in itself? Sometimes the most frightening things in life aren't monsters or demons. Sometimes all it takes is the profound sense of isolation that we all have to deal with exacerbated by the expectations of those that don't truly understand us. Anyway, I'll stop my armchair psychologizing. I may have used my dulcet tones to trick you into thinking there's more going on upstairs than there actually is, but trust me, listeners. You could replace my brain with one decaying zombie trudging along on a gerbil wheel and no one would notice the difference. In fact, it might be a bit of an upgrade. Thanks for joining me tonight. In my part of the world, the days are getting a bit shorter and the temperature a bit cooler. I'll be with you every week as we continue the inexorable slide into Halloween season, and I couldn't be happier. Until next time, listeners, stay spooky. You've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Tonight's episode was hosted and narrated by yours truly, Eric Peabody. Original music provided by Eric Peabody and Nikki McSorley. Finalization by N.M. Brown and S.K. Brown. Got a terrifying tale of your own that you'd like performed? Email it to us at natalie at chillingtalesfordarknights.com to have your work considered for future production. Seeing as how we're all living in a technological nightmare of our own devising, I'll ask you to follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights on social media and upvote, subscribe, and hit the bell notification icon if you're listening to this on YouTube. Not only will you have appeased the dark gods of cyberspace, but you'll be kept in the loop as we prepare more terrifying content. If you'd like access to uninterrupted horror, free of ads, and these annoying bookend segments, might I recommend signing up for our Patreon? You'll get access to hundreds of episodes of this show, as well as everything else from the other programs in the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights Cabal. That means all of Otis Cheery's Scary Stories Told in the Dark Drew Blood's Dark Tales, Paul J. McSorley's Fear from the Heartland, and more. It's a veritable smorgasbord of horrific delights. As for me, personally, I'm on most social media sites as Viking Guitar or Viking Guitar Productions. I'm always on the lookout for new stories to narrate and new music projects to mix or master. If that's of interest to you, feel free to reach out and we can talk turkey. Also, I will be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. If darkness is what you're after, listener, your search is over. Yet, let it be known, you haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you.